Good evening. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the William G. McGowan this, the, this evening for our discussion on the history and impact of alcohol regulations. And welcome to those of you who are joining us on our YouTube channel. This program is the latest in a series relating to our special exhibit, Spirited Republic, Alcohol in American History, which is upstairs in the Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery through January 10th. The exhibit uses National Archives documents and artifacts to show how government programs and policies changed over time and to illustrate the wide varieties of views Americans have had about alcohol. If you haven't seen it already, I encourage you to add it to your to-do list. Before we begin with our discussion tonight, I'd like to tell you about a few programs coming up here next week. On Wednesday, October 28th at noon, historian Jay Winnick will be here to discuss his new book, 1944, FDR and the Year That Changed History. And the following day at noon, Kevin Lippert will discuss his book, War Plan Red, the United States' secret plan to invade Canada and Canada's secret plan to invade the United States. Book signings will follow both of these programs. That evening on October 29th at 7, we welcome Associate Justice Samuel Alito as part of our series of conversations with United States Supreme Court Justices, Yale Law Professor and Constitutional Scholar Akhil Reed Amar will lead the discussion focusing on ideas, viewpoints, and issues related to the Constitution. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events in print or online at archives.gov. There are copies in the lobby as well as a sign-up sheet where you can receive it by regular mail or email. Another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports the work of the agency, especially its outreach and education programs. And there are applications for membership also in the lobby. During the 13-year great experiment of prohibition, opponents argued that enforcement was impossible. They, de they decried the appearance of illegal distilleries, the use of residential properties to make alcohol, and especially gangsterism and corruption in law enforcement, all concerns reflected in our spirited republic exhibit. At the time the 18th Amendment was repealed in 1933, people no longer wanted nationwide restrictions on alcohol, but neither did they want to return to the excesses that led to prohibition. When the 21st Amendment was repealed, repealed the 18th, it also, it also granted states broad authority to regulate alcohol, the alcoholic beverage industry. The federal government continues to play a role in regulating and taxing alcohol, fulfilling its patent and trademark functions, conducting scientific research, and warning about the dangers of alcohol abuse. The National Archives records, for example, the records of public laws, trademark labels, public health posters, and films about drunk driving reflect this continuing federal interest. Tonight, historian Garrett Peck will lead a conversation with alcohol industry executives on how these regulations came to be, their respective roles in the three-tier system of alcohol production and distribution, and their insights on the current state of alcohol regulation and how they respond to challenges and calls to change or even abolish the system. To introduce Mr. Peck, I'd like to call forth a friend and, and the president of the National Archives Foundation, author and journalist, Olivia Bundles, who is at work on her fourth book, The Joy Goddess of Harlem. Olivia Walker, I'm not done. <laughs> and the Harlem Renaissance a biography of her great-grandmother, and if she would only finish this book, we can have a party to celebrate, <laughs> whose parties, friendships, international travel, and arts patronage helped define the era. On her own ground, The Life and Times of Madam C.J. Walker, her biography of her great-great-grandmother was named a New York Times notable book. Please welcome Olivia Bundles, who's already here. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And, and my great-great-grandmother, Lilia Walker, whose book is almost finished, it happens during Prohibition. So I am so immersed in this, in this era when people are drinking more than ever. So as, uh, as the 
uh, chairman of the board of the a private partner of the National Archives, of the National Archives Foundation. Uh, I am someone who represents a wonderful staff and a wonderful board that works together to generate um, financial support and creative support for the exhibitions and programs and educational initiatives of the National Archives. And it's just really a delight to have David as a partner and the wonderful people on the National Archives staff. David mentioned, I think, a little bit our membership in the National Archives Foundation. Uh, many of you are members. We thank you very much for that. You can go to archivesfoundation.org where you will see the calendar of events and the various membership levels. So we urge you to, to join. I was backstage, so I didn't hear everything David said, but he usually says we never turn down any applications. And that is true, we welcome all of you. So please join us uh, and come to some future events. As David mentioned, this year the foundation is very proud to support Spirited Republic Alcohol in American History in the Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery. This has been such a popular exhibition and the programming has been popular and it really is due to the support of many of you who are here in the audience. We thank our exhibition sponsors, um, some of you whom are here with us, so if you are, just raise your hand. But History, uh, History Channel has been a big supporter. Uh, the Lawrence F. O'Brien family and our board member, Larry O'Brien. Wine and Spirits, Wholesalers of America, and you will hear from Brian Fox, who will be on the panel. The Tasting Panel Magazine, the Beer Institute. Anybody, do I, do I see any hands? Thank you. <laughs> the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States, the National Alcohol Beverage Control Association, and Jim Squeo, and I hope that I have said that right. Jim has a last name that's as challenging as my first name, but we are really glad to have him here. He will be on the panel. The National Beer Wholesalers Association, uh, Castle Brands Kelly Spillane will be on our panel, and Warren Scheidt from the Alcohol Beverage Licensees Association will be on the panel this evening. Uh, I would like to invite our panelists to the stage, and I know that uh, Tom Nastic is back there getting them, prepping them to come forward. And as they come on, I just want to introduce our moderator. Garrett Pack is an author, historian, and tour guide. I understand he does a great Walt Whitman tour through um, downtown DC. He has written several books on alcohol, including Capital Beer, A Heady History of Brewing in Washington, D.C., and Prohibition in Washington, D.C., How Dry We Weren't. <laughs> Garrett was involved with the D.C. Craft Bartenders Guild in lobbying the D.C. City Council to have the Ricky declared Washington's native cocktail in 2001. I think I remember some lime Rickies from my college years. He researched and pinpointed the Washington Brewery site at Navy Yard and is particularly proud that the Green Hat Gin is named after a character that he wrote about in his book, Prohibition in Washington, D.C., the congressional era bootlegger uh, George Cassidy. Garrett is on the board of the Woodrow Wilson House and the Arlington Historical Society and is a member of the Association of the Oldest Inhabitants of DC. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Garrett Peck. Thank you, Lelia, and thank you all for coming out here tonight. I'm going to get my reading glasses on so I can read just a couple of things here about our panel. I want to thank you all so much for coming out here tonight, uh, and for all the people who are both here in the theater and also the people who are online watching this event as it's live streamed here tonight. I'll be your moderator for this exciting and hopefully lively and fun panel, The History and Impact of Alcohol Regulation. I've written three different books about Americans and, and our rather quirky relationship to alcohol. Uh, probably the deepest one that goes into this is called The Prohibition Hangover, Alcohol in America from Demon Rum to Cult Cabernet. And I dealt with a fair amount of time looking at the three-tier system, how we got to this point today where we attempted to stuff the proverbial genie back in the bottle. Once prohibition ended, how were we going to regulate this monster that we were now legalizing again? So we will look at how America has regulated alcohol since the end of prohibition in 1933. 
We'll talk about the, the, what we call today the three-tier system of alcohol distribution and what that has meant for the country in the past eight or so decades. As you may know, the three-tier system consists of alcohol producers at the first tier, such as brewers, distillers, and winemakers, distributors and wholesalers at the second tier, and at the third tier is the retail point of sale, including bars, restaurants, liquor stores, and supermarkets, and, and, and so on. We have assembled a panel from each of the, th the three tiers to provide their expertise tonight. So please welcome our panelists. Representing the first peer, tier, the alcohol producers, is T. Kelly Spillane, Senior Vice President for Global Sales at Castle Brands, who joined the company in 2000. Prior to joining Castle, Spillane worked at Carillon Importers Limited, a division of Grand Metropolitan PLC. Carillon developed and launched a few brands that you may have heard of, including Absolute Vodka and Bombay Sapphire Gin. So welcome, Kelly. Our next panelist represents the second tier, the distributors. Brian Fox is the chair of the Wine and Spirits Wholesalers of America, the National Trade Association for Wine and Spirits Distributors, and is the president and CEO of Grand Rapids-based Henry A. Fox Sales Company. Brian is the second person in his family to chair the WSWA. His father, Henry Happy Fox, was chair of the National Trade Group in 1996. Welcome, Brian. Our third panelist represents uh, an interesting twist in the three-tier system, what we call the control jurisdictions, that serve bo as both distributor and retailer for alcohol. Jim Squillo is the president and CEO of the National Alcohol Beverage Control Association, or NABCA, a national association representing jurisdictions that directly control the distribution and sale of beverage alcohol within their borders. Now in his 47th year with NABCA, yes, <laughs> I think he started in grade school, Jim's broad knowledge uh, of the control system and the alcoholic beverage industry is evident in the growth that NAPCA has experienced during his tenure. Welcome, Jim. <laughs> and our final panelist, who comes the farthest, is representing the third tier, the point of sale. And that is Warren Scheidt, who is the proud owner of Cork Liquors with 12 stores in and around Columbus, Indiana. He currently serves as the president, uh, the president of American Beverage Licensees, the nation's preeminent trade association for beer, wine, and spirits retailers that re represents thousands of on and off premise licensees in 30 states across the country. Starting as a single store in 1982 by Scheidt's parents, Cork Liquors is now a three generation family business as Warren is joined by his son, Travis, and daughter Allison, who work alongside him. Welcome, Warren. I'm going to take my seat here with the panel so we can get to the fun part, which is the conversation. So let's start off with the man who has spent uh, 47 years in the industry. And uh, if, you would, if you wouldn't mind, Jim, and give us a quick little overview of what the three-tier system, if, you might, if you'd like to give us the the, sorry, the Warren, if you'd like to give us the, the big picture of what the three-tier system is and how it came about. Okay. Um, <clears throat> to know where we are, you need to know where we've been. And I believe uh, this country, as, as well as several other, all countries, have had issues with alcohol consumption in their history. So most of us uh, believe that the three-tier system has worked wonderfully well since Prohibition, but it's fair to say that prior to Prohibition, the uh, regulations that existed in the country did not work so well. And it caused uh, what many would consider an overreach in Prohibition. And we found out that Prohibition didn't work so well. So in our history, um, we tried very little regulation, and we weren't pleased with that. And then we tried too much regulation, and that didn't work either. 
So we came out of prohibition in 33, recognizing that uh, too little or too much was not the way to go. And so I think um, the feds realized they couldn't get it right because what worked, what would potentially work for New York City would not necessarily work for Salt Lake City. So they threw it back to the states. But there were some caveats that were recommended uh, either in the book toward liquor control but per, that was uh, commissioned by John Rockefeller III um, to recommend to the states how they should handle the sale and distribution of alcohol. There were a few uh, recommendations that whether a state adopted a control model or a license model that they all felt uh, very comfortable with. First, the three-tier system. And this was done um, primarily to ensure that no tier exerted undue influence on another tier. This was felt that it caused a great deal of problems prior to prohibition. And I think that we realized that the Tide House, uh, prior to prohibition, where a, a licensed establishment uh, was often owned by a supplier and therefore the supplier was more interested in the bottom line um, growth, the revenue uh, derived, as opposed to being a part of the community. So after uh, prohibition, uh, basically the three-tier system was set up to try to keep these uh, three tiers separate without exerting the kind of influence that would uh, negate any public health uh, issues that we were all still very concerned with. So I think as you think about alcohol, it's, it's not um, something that this country has uh, just decided to adopt a three-tier system. It's fair to say that we went through some very difficult times on both extremes of the uh, regulatory uh, side of this uh, product. And I think um, Many would submit that the regulatory uh, vehicle that this country has adopted by state by state is one that has been uh, potentially the most successful in the world. Um, the UK continues to fight with uh, very high binge drinking rates, even though they have higher tax rates than the US. Uh, they also, it's also suggested that the US has a thriving entrepreneurial craft industry plus a lot of selections that you don't see around the world. So one could argue that our blueprint for success has been a regulation that separates the tiers and gives each tier a chance to thrive. More importantly, it does give a smaller um, producers and others to have a chance in this marketplace. Be mindful that when you go to McDonald's, you can't get Pepsi. You have to have Coke. That doesn't happen in the alcohol beverage industry. You go to a bar and you have a great deal of selection. It's not a ruled or run by one supplier. And so that's the difference between a commodity that has uh, created some concerns in this country because of the abuse and the harm that it can cause that the other food industries tend not to have and they have been monopolized in some ways by the very large companies that can afford to um, make sure that the smaller guys don't get much of a chance. Mm -hmm. So where we are today is the three-tier system is because of what we have gone through and uh, suffered through over the course of uh, the history of the US, United States. Yeah, I find it interesting that the person who sponsored that report was John D. Rockefeller Jr. And of course, his family's company was uh, Standard Oil. And of course, they were broken up. They were a verticalized industry, and they were broken up by the, by the federal government. And I think this is one of these things where, with the Tide House Saloon system, you know, they decided to break that up as well. So, Brian, did you want to add to that? I know you have a, some history with, in that, yeah, with that background. And I'll start with you know, what Jim talked about in terms of you know, really struggling with this uh, uh, 
this alcohol question, it's a, it's, a, it's a sensitive product. It is a unique product. It needs to be handled correctly and in the appropriate way. And my family, um, I have an interesting history. You know, I'm, I'm now in the wholesale business, but my family started out as brewers. And, uh, you know, I can only imagine my relatives who uh, were forced out of business uh, prior to prohibition by um, a vote of the people, um, what that felt like. So you know, there was certainly there were uh, tumultuous times, and uh, the big the big challenge with um, coming out of prohibition was this concept of Tide House, and Tide House, as Jim mentioned, is the the concept of the producer uh, having control or ownership of the uh, the reseller or the seller at the point of sale, and so what you had in the in back in um, pre-prohibition days is you had these saloons that were popping up next to factories that were open 24 hours a day for all the shifts. They'd go in on their lunch breaks, wouldn't go home after work. Um, you had these producers from far away that didn't really worry about over-promotion. They didn't really worry, you know, the, the factory's got to run, they, gotta per they have a capacity, and if they had to lower the price to move it, they would. And so um, the, that, that, that's basically what the tight house situation was. And it goes a little further than that because it's it's, it's, it's more, it's also influence. And whether it's extended credit terms so that they would be in hock to the producer or whether it was forcing the um, saloon to just carry their own products. And you think about tight house rules and selection and Jim hit it right on the mark. And there are other countries in this world that have tight house rules. And uh, you know, you don't see a lot of selection. You see a fraction of the selection you see in the United States because of tight house uh, situation. So, um, you know, I, the big thing come out of prohibition was to um, eliminate, eliminate those type of uh, provisions so that there wasn't undue uh, influence um, on the local level. Yeah, one of the interesting things I think, essentially having the different tiers, each tier of course is gonna bump the price up a little bit, right? That's just part of the natural economics of it all. So I think part of it was they wanted to make sure there wouldn't be cheap liquor again. Um, that was what I think what they were thinking in 1933. So that was part of the economic reasons for how this came about. So let's shift the, d the debate now and uh, let's talk about how it's actually worked out here over the years. So I wanted to ask Kelly, because Kelly here is a, an alcohol producer. So his company produces different spirits and gets them out into the marketplace. How important is the three-tier system for you? Can you, in fact, get your products out there? Do you have any stumbling bro blocks that you experience along the way? Well, I would, I would define my career in two chapters so far. You know, the, the first 15 are the fun 15. You know, <laughs> ma ma imagine being 25 years old and running 19 states for Absolute Vodka and Bombay Sapphire. You know, you, you wake up every morning, you're up 25%, you pat yourself on the back and you say, when's lunch, you know? And uh, you start to think you're so good that you can do it with any brand. Uh, the second 15 can be defined as the fighting 15. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet Mark Andrews who's in the audience tonight who, and craft distillers take heart here, I owned a very, very small Irish single malt whiskey and had designs to commercialize the brand and bring it to the United States. I could do that. I've done this for 15 years. Should be easy, right? Well, the four of us hunkered down in an office in Houston, put together a business plan, and man, did I start to see the importance of the three-tier system. Um, the first thing I needed to do was to call up every friend I had in the world and say, can you have a meeting with me? Uh, now imagine you're four people sitting in Houston, Texas, trying to build a 50-state business, an international business. You have limited financial means, although the financial means that we had were, were more than adequate for what we were trying to do. You understand that the middle tier becomes extremely important. Well, what do they offer you? They offer you local knowledge. Is your brand going to work in my market? You know, they offer you local resources. Here's my staff of sometimes as many as six, 700 salespeople that call on accounts every day. Um, you start to realize, okay, I cannot make it without the second tier or the third tier system. What's my responsibility? My responsibility is to create unique enough products for consumers like yourselves to go into a bar that has 100 different offerings or a store that's got 1,000 different offerings and say, that's unique. I want to give it a shot. That brand never gets on a back bar or a store shelf unless the middle tier believes in your brand. Um, so it's a real collaborative effort between three tiers. We started Castle Brands. We also went, you know, my, I have a lot of experience in the control system. Um, we went to the state of New Hampshire, northeastern state, Irish products, good demographics. They bought into the concept 
and allowed us to build brands through their control system. What did it give us? It gave us immediate 100% distribution, which is impossible in an open state. It gave us, quote unquote, Nielsen ratings. I could go to every other open state and say, the state of New Hampshire's consumer is doing this with my brands. Will you give me a shot? Um, so it enabled us to build a strong northeastern business. Um, so from a, and I'm probably not that far off, Mark, but we probably did 800 to 1,000 cases our first year. Uh, we finished last year as a publicly traded company doing just under $60 million in sales, uh, experiencing double-digit growth again this year. Um, so it's a long, hard fight, but collaboration through the three tiers creates selection, opportunity, and allows you to marshal your revenues the best way as possible. And if you were a small producer, say if you were a small craft distiller or a, or a small local <laughs> brewery, how does that work out for them? How do they get access to market? Given oftentimes they don't have the scale to like go global or even go oh, national. You know, you know? We, we didn't have the scale either. You know, we were four people in an office. Um, belief in yourself, number one, obviously. Belief in your product, it has to be there. What makes your product unique and different? If you're going to be a Me Too that, you know, InBev already has, guess what? That big foot that's about to fall on your head is going to crush you. You know, you have to have something that a consumer is going to say, that's different, I'd like to try it. But the most important thing is financial resources. You know, if you need to create a brand. Every, there are a lot of people out there that can create a great bourbon, a great vodka, a great beer, a craft beer, a great wine. Um, ultimately, though, people buy brands. And unless you have the financial resources to put that great juice of yours into a bottle and create a brand, uh, you're going to find an extremely <coughs> tough time succeeding in this business. Mm -hmm. Garrett, if I may, sure. uh, there was a, a Boston Consulting Group did a study on the beer industry about a year ago. And it was very interesting because you know, you know, they were basically assessed with trying to understand, you know, does the three-tier system, does that wholesaler tier, distributor tier add value? And uh, the, the synopsis of the study was that um, in, in, in the in, with an independent distribution, small producers can uh, free ride on the major producers to get to the marketplace. And you just don't see that. You don't see that in the snack aisle. You don't see that in the soup aisle. You don't see small producers able to get out quickly into the marketplace and try their products. And that's what Kelly's talking about. You know, the product's got to, it's got to have validity with the consumer, but you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, innovation is trial and error. And, and if you can't get out there in front of the consumer, you don't know if it's working or not. Mm -hmm. And you know, the one final point is that I don't know of any other system in the world, you know, the control system offers a completely level playing field. You know, I have much, I have much exposure to a consumer as Jameson Irish Whiskey does, you know, right out of the gate. So it's a, it's a unique setup that if you've got a proposition that's a unique proposition, you've got good juice in the bottle, there are opportunities to make the system work for you and work for you well. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, let's look at the other end, the, the point of sale, the customer end. So where customers go to buy products and consume them and, and so on. Um, let's ask Warren Scheidt from Indiana about, since you've been in the, the industry now for more than three decades, how is, has the three-tier system worked out for you? Okay. And, and also talk about your specific circumstances. I know you're in Indiana and there still are no Sunday sales in Indiana, are there? Right. And that's something to keep yeah. in mind. Every state has yeah. a wide range of laws mm -hmm. uh, that we live by, depending on where you're at, and different reasons for those laws. Uh, we started in business uh, 34 years ago with my parents. And uh, I can honestly say it is much more challenging and also much more fun now mm -hmm. than it was 34 years ago. The only thing I'm not sure about then was when my mother was running the office and writing my paycheck. Now I have my daughter writing the paycheck. <laughs> and somehow she's got a bigger office than I do. I just have yeah. a desk. <laughs> so I haven't quite figured out how that happened yet. But uh, in, the, in the retail side, um, there's various things we've done to adapt. Uh, for one thing, we have, for instance, in one town, we have seven stores. Our store size can run from 2,800 square feet to 13,000 square feet. And in today's mode, 13,000 isn't all that large of a store, although it's by far bigger than most. But uh, the, the influx of new products is just staggering. Mm -hmm. uh, 
we almost have to go by the rule of if a new one comes in, something else has to go out. Either it's just old and doesn't sell anymore or it doesn't turn quick enough. Uh, the, the placement on shelves for all tiers uh, to get their products in our stores uh, is quite challenging. Uh, in the course of a week, uh, we probably uh, talked to eight different beer wholesalers, um, sales reps for the liquor and wine industry, probably 25 to 30 in the course of a week. Each one, almost every time they come in the door, is peddling a new product or a new line. Mm -hmm. uh, so as you can imagine, that is quite challenging. And sometimes you get tired of tasting all those different <laughs> things, but somebody's got to do it. Yeah. So we, we manage, sometimes we have to split it up a little bit. Uh, but, but it goes as far as retailing even, uh, for instance, you know, in, in the beer industry, uh, I have a cooler in my main store that is 30 doors. Uh, it holds 750 different facings of products. Uh, used to, we had full doors of single products. Uh, Budweiser, Miller, Strohs, Pabst. That shows how long ago we we'll talked about some of those. <laughs> Wiedemann, you know. But uh, all great products, but now with 750 different facings, there are no two items duplicated. Uh, the, the product may be the same, but it's in a different package. For instance, and let's take a, a major brand that's probably the biggest, Bud Light. I sell Bud Light in 17 different packages mm. to meet the consumer demand, and believe me, Anheuser-Busch is more than glad to make as many different packages as they can uh, put out because they want everybody to get uh, what they want. So uh, that shows you the, the choice that is out there. But we also uh, deal with the technology. Uh, I never dreamed until a few years ago people would be shopping with these things, walking up and down the aisle and uh, looking up information on their phone to get uh, more details. We set stores with the capability of having, uh, since I'm from Indiana, an Indiana section of beer, an Indiana section of uh, liquor, uh, Indiana wines, because a lot of people, when they're traveling, uh, they come in and they want to take home something from that state. Mm -hmm. And it has been very popular. It has also helped uh, those industries, uh, mostly new starting craft industries, to gain a foothold uh, in the industry. And although in a lot of times, in, most, in a lot of states, uh, we do argue and disagree with the craft people, to some degree, but that will all work out. Uh, their presence has been uh, helpful as far as engaging the public and getting people in the stores trying new products. Uh, the older generations, my generation before, were very brand loyal, and in most cases probably drank the same thing their father drank. The new millennial generation uh, is completely different. They try every new thing that comes in the door. I can't say their loyalty is as strong to any one product, but they sure try a lot of different <laughs> products, uh, which overall is good. I mean, it, uh, it brings the creativity and uh, enthusiasm, uh, and we get a lot of products in on Thursday mornings. They are a lot of times there before we can get the trucks unloaded to try something new that may be coming in the store. Mm. So cool. that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. Now, one of the things that the 21st Amendment gave the states the right to do, which was to regulate alcohol, and one of those things, of course, that consumers always challenge rules over, over time. So we've seen a lot of the three-tier system over time get challenged or rules have been changed. And let me give you a quick example, and I'll ask you about this specifically about Indiana, about Sunday sales. <coughs> and about the debate they're going on right now. Yeah, we've had uh, that ongoing debate for probably the last, at least the last 10 years. Uh, the, the legislature in Indiana has, has always kept uh, the Sunday sales issue uh, <laughs> the way it has been uh, for various reasons, but uh, Indiana is not the only state 
Uh, matter of fact, Indiana is not uh, exclusive, exclusive in not selling alcohol on Sunday. We sell alcohol on Sunday. You can get a drink at a bar, a restaurant, a hotel, a pizza place, a, a tasting room, a sporting event. There is plenty of alcohol to be had. Uh, can you buy it from me on Sunday? No. Or Kroger? No. Uh, but uh, you never know when that can change. Our, our association in Indiana actually sponsored a bill or helped get one pushed through to change that last year where we could sell on Sunday. And the interesting thing was the groups that have previously been in favor of that totally flipped the other way and got the bill killed. So it was close, but there was a difference of opinion on who should be able to do what. Uh, we wanted them to live by some of the same rules that we have to abide by. And that's something everyone should know. Not the, even though you sell, you may sell the same case of beer or the same bottle of liquor, uh, the rules by which you sell those are rarely the same. There's different business models on how all those products are sold. And that, therein lies the general reason why there's always ongoing litigation and battles in the legislature over who's, who and how a product is sold. Mm -hmm. So that's one example of how the three-tier system in essence, it keeps evolving, right? People, consumers want new things and, and whatnot. Um, what other examples can you guys bring up here that how the system has evolved over time or how it's met challenges? I'll, I'll take the first shot at it. You know, I worked in uh, <coughs> California 30 years ago for Seagram's right out of college and um, essentially called on 14 different wholesalers. Uh, so there's been a big, great consolidation at the wholesale level um, in terms of the amount of doors we can push our brands through as a supplier. So you have to you know, uh, choose your business model a bit differently that way. Um, if you found somebody in California 30 years ago that wasn't doing the job, you went down the street and you pointed somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. So um, you have to find more of a way to work, uh, ways of working you know, that assimilate your uh, company into the one or two guys that you have an opportunity to do statewide business with. The second biggest challenge over the 30 years ago has been the influx of the chain business in various markets. Um, how to deal with supermarket chains, how to make money in a chain, in a, in a uh, system driven by uh, supermarket chains that are used to working on extremely low margin on products. So those have been the two biggest changes in the three-tier yeah, system I, I for me. I think another uh, issue that's happened is uh, direct shipping. Uh, that's uh, uh, anathema to a three-tier um, protagonist. Uh, and, and that came about because of the, uh, the folks traveling to Napa and Sonoma and finding wines they really wanted and they couldn't get it shipped to their home. So uh, while it doesn't go through necessarily a distributor or the second tier, uh, several states have allowed that uh, direct shipping. So that is one change in the three-tier system. I think it's important to also recognize that the three-tier system does exist in some other industries. Um, I mean, there is wholesalers for meats and foods and some groceries. So it's not necessarily unique to the alcohol beverage industry, but the fact that um, a wholesaler or supplier can't do shelf sets in a store, uh, and that, that's not a part of the three-tier system. That's part of the regulatory structure that this country felt was important to not just uh, protect those tiers, but to protect public health as well. And I think what we have found is while there have been some evolution and uh, acceptance, open doors, as um, Warren mentioned, uh, the, the iPhone, and, and the, you can Google, you can take a picture of a product and you can find it. But this direct shipping is, is starting to um, provide more access and more customer convenience that uh, the three-tier system strictly doesn't necessarily um, provide. So I think that I suspect we'll see more uh, changes, but the uh, backdrop, if you will, of this, um, of the regulation for alcohol is to protect um, the communities and public health. And I think that's what is so difficult to, why Sunday sales in Indiana probably has been 
a little more difficult. Some people are reluctant to make some of those changes. Yeah, the biggest, uh, I think probably the most obvious example of a challenge to the three-tier system is, is, was a big Supreme Court case argued 10 years ago called Granholm versus Held. And that was the one that effectively legalized direct ship by saying the states can allow it if they want, but they have to do it on a non-discriminatory basis. So either allow everyone to do it or allow no one to do it, but don't allow your own people to have uh, an unfair advantage in that. Um, at the time, I know a lot of wholesalers had a lot of qualms about, about, the, about the idea of direct ship. So just wanted to ask, 10 years after, Grand, after the Granholm decision, how has that impacted it? Specifically, of course, this is about wine, right? Yeah, well, I think that's, I mean, first you got to talk about Granholm, right? So that uh, Michigan governor, by the way, um, Supreme Court case that basically asked a very narrow question of whether or not a wine producer should be able to ship to a consumer in a given state outside of the wine producer's uh, jurisdiction. And uh, uh, the Supreme Court came down, it was a very close vote, but said because that some states were uh, doing that, uh, allowing their in-state wineries to ship directly to the consumer, there was inconsistencies with commerce law. Um, but what the Granholm case did say, and they were very clear on saying, is that the three-tier system is unequivocally legitimate. That the uh, Granholm case by no means said that the three-tier system um, was anything but, uh, a rel anything but relevant. It was certainly relevant and needed in, uh, in the marketplace. So Granholm, what, 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 uh, what precipitated after Granholm was basically states making direct shipping laws. Um, uh, in a licensed, regulated environment, allowing wineries to ship to consumers. So these laws that these states created allow for accountability, allow for licensing, allow for orderly tax collection, and transparency. The one thing we haven't talked about here that's really important with the system is a, is a line of sight. We have a very transparent line of sight from beginning to end in the system, from producer to consumer, uh, and that's important when you're talking about sensitive product. So. Um, Ten years down the road, um, you know, I, I think we um, we have some work to do. Um, I, you know, our, our the, the wholesalers, Wine Spirits Wholesalers of America, you know, the ship has sailed on on these states creating these laws. But the laws are there, and the laws are in the books. Uh, the challenge is making sure those laws are enforced correctly. So there's a lot of a lot of laws in there. Provide for the safeguards. Provide for um, checking if someone's 21. Provide for making sure tax is collected provide for not over shipping to the consumer. But you know, we, we're finding across the country there's some challenges with enforcement. And uh, uh, you know, you know, we, we've, uh, we've done some studying. I, I'll give you an example. In Illinois, um, they, they have found by just um, doing a Freedom of Information Act with uh, the third party shippers, which, which they can do in Illinois because that law that they have there, uh, they found that um, the law was dramatically not being fouled. And 10% of the goods coming in the state were not being accounted for. Um, and I think that leads to a bigger thing that's happened post Granholm is this uh, now that there's some shipping of alcohol going through third party carriers, whether it is, uh, um, you know, some of it's being done according to the law. Um, some, of the, some of it's being done according, not according to the law, but the law could be enforced and those producers could do it correctly. The third part, I think, is the bigger issue that we're facing that there's uh, bootlegging is here and today in America. And we think of bootlegging, and we think of the 20s, and we think of people shipping across lines at night, across the uh, Canadian border. Well, it's happening on the internet, and it's happening every day. And so I think that's the big challenge we have. And it's a challenge because the states, uh, the states that the same people that decide whether or not they want to have Sunday sales, they should be able to hold someone accountable if they ship alcohol in their state. They should know where that alcohol is coming from. They should know if it's taxed. Uh, they should know if the person pur purchasing is 21. So I think we have some work to do there. Wine Spirits Wholesalers America, you know, we have uh, invested in a, um, a delivery company, a market, not a delivery company, a marketplace app that enables retailers to deliver to, to the consumer. Uh, and we're doing that in a way that um, it has to be uh, in accordance to state laws. It has to go through the three-tier system, uh, state-of-the-art uh, age verification, uh, is, is done to make sure that someone is um, of legal drinking age. So I think the idea that electronic commerce is here to stay is, is accurate, and I think to Jim's point, it's gonna keep evolving. 
but it needs to evolve in the right way. And we think things like Drizzly that allow for the state laws to be upheld and for the system of regulatory and licensing to be upheld is the right way to go. Uh, and we're, you know, we're going to be, we're going to have to face this as a whole industry to make sure, um, you know, Kelly wants to know where his goods are. He wants to know where they're, they're going. He wants to know um, whether or not it's his goods. Uh, you go to China and you buy a, a brand of, uh, a, you know, you buy Johnny Walker. Yeah, there's a high percentage it's not Johnny Walker. I mean, that's how bad it is in China. So line of sight and transparency is very important in our industry. Gotcha, cool. We've actually seen the development of uh, smaller wholesalers. Uh, I told some people earlier this where uh, kind of a branching off of the, of the bigger wholesalers, um, it, it's not meant to alleviate uh, shipping into a state. But, but a lot of smaller people, but smaller craft brewers, distillers, wineries uh, can, can team up with some of the, the new smaller wholesalers that push literally just those type of products. And we're starting to see those crop up and they definitely serve a purpose. But one thing we tell any craft person or anybody that comes in, you need to still be able to represent your own product. Never expect any wholesaler just to do that for you. They will do the best they can, depending on the <coughs> any other portfolio that they have. But always be able to come in and tell your own story, uh, how you got started, how you make your product. Because when we talk to our customers, they want to hear about those specific craft products and that's a niche you know they can fall into a uh, very successful niche uh, but uh, you know that's just an offshoot of the shipping thing and as as you said our part of our 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 concerns are to make sure that that product is getting uh, because it definitely affects the retail tier too not just uh, the wholesalers if it's getting shipped direct they're not buying it from me mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure it gets to the right people it's not getting in the hands of underage people. Uh, and we want to make sure taxes are being collected uh, across the country, wherever they're supposed to be collected. I'm like most of you, you know, we all pay taxes. And uh, so, you know, we are definitely at a competitive disadvantage if someone is moving a product that is not paying taxes. Mm -hmm. so. gotcha. Well, shifting gears a little bit, I wanted to ask uh, Jim about we have an interesting system in this country. At the end of Prohibition, 32 states decided to become what we call uh, licensed jurisdictions, and the other 18 or so chose to become controlled jurisdiction. And, and why was this? How did this come about? Well, in fairness, uh, this is not unique to the United <clears throat> States. Um, a control model actually uh, was first developed in Sweden, and it is in several countries. Uh, the, Nordic countries are all control. All of Canada is a control model. Uh, there are countries in South America. And uh, one could argue the most control uh, exerted is in the Middle East, where no alcohol is allowed. So mm -hmm. a control model is not that unique. I think that India, the most populous nation, if not today, <laughs> maybe soon, uh, has a third of their country is control. So this is, uh, while for this country, uh, as entrepreneurial and as capitalistic as the U.S. Uh, is, back in the 30s, these states uh, felt that they still wanted to exert some control over who was getting this product and when you could buy this product. And so, um, based on the recommendation from the pamphlet Toward Liquor Control, it was uh, felt the, these jurisdictions felt that the best way to uh, reduce the harm alcohol can cause was to adopt a control system of um, sales and distribution. Now, of the 18 markets, um, it's fair to say not one is alike. There are no two alike. They're all different. They've all adopted uh, different forms of uh, control. The main thing is they take ownership of the product at some point in the business cycle. So. Um, I think 
the suppliers, Kelly alluded to the fact that in a control uh, environment, he does have a more level playing field and a chance to grow his brand. So there are some suppliers that recognize its um, validity and its worth. And Garrett, I think it's also um, f fair to say that there are some licensed states that have more strict control of how alcohol is sold and or distributed. Um, won't mention those by name, but uh, I think <laughs> this is the <laughs> this is the most democratic product in this country because uh, the most iconic brand that exists uh, in um, American in the American distilled spirits industry is Jack Daniel, and you cannot sample Jack Daniels in their uh, distillery. It is a dry distillery, Lynchburg, Tennessee. You cannot uh, taste their product. So. I think it, you know, be, be mindful that um, communities are still dry, that states deal with this product differently as their culture and their demographic would suggest. And I think that uh, that has uh, survived for uh, the 80 plus years since uh, prohibition. Mm -hmm. now, there's been some talk over the last, certainly over the last decade or so, yeah. about like privatization. We've seen like movements towards that. And yeah, I figured you'd. Washington and, <laughs> and um, Virginia. <laughs> Pennsylvania, of course, that one yeah. always comes up. Well, it's, it's fair to say that uh, the states make a lot of money, make a lot of revenue, and that revenue, um, there are a lot of special uh, interest groups that would um, like to get a uh, part of that. So they're very interested. Uh, you know, for uh, large big box stores that can sell spirits and uh, other alcohol beverages in other states would very much like to do so in the control markets. Uh, you know. Additionally, the, um, the ideological bent for many uh, politicians in this country is that if the private sector can do it, why is the government involved in the business? And so there, that philosophical belief or ideology, ideology, we can't necessarily argue, except for the fact that um, there are still those in Virginia uh, that have issues with alcohol and are very happy with their system. So while Governor McDonald um, put it in as part of his campaign and tried to make it through, even the Republican caucus, and Governor McDonald was Republican, the Republican caucus could not get a majority to uh, approve uh, privatization. So in Virginia, they're very happy with their system. In Pennsylvania, there's a lot of different factors. Um, and I, su I would uh, suggest that Washington did privatize, but one of the large big box retailers spent $22 million on an initiative campaign, got it on the ballot, and uh, was able to campaign very heavily and, and make uh, a difference. So uh, my suspicion is that the control model will exist for some time to come um, because alcohol is a unique product and 30% of the people in this country don't drink at all. And 20% of the people who do drink, drink less than one drink a month. So there's still a great portion of the population that very seldom drinks. I don't know them. <laughs> <laughs> That's, <laughs> yeah, they're somewhere. They're but but um, I, I think it's fair to say that alcohol still is not as accepted uh, a product as potato chips or bread. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'd, I'd just like to finish up by saying one thing. And, you know, we all live in different states. We all live in 50 different states. But um, if the state is asked to take away a significant portion of their revenue and hand it over to the private sector, they're going to want to replace that revenue somehow. And I think, you know, when you look at all the programs, all the departments that liquor revenue supports in the control system, and you go to a model like Washington where the state stepped in and said, well, hold it. We want our revenue guaranteed. Uh, consumers lost in the end. It didn't result in lower prices. It resulted in higher prices because any time you jam a fourth tier into a three-tier system and add a markup attached to it, lower prices do not happen. Um, states are not in the business of giving away money to the private sector, especially when they've been collecting revenue off of this system for 80-plus years. Um, so when you look at XYZ states saying, well, that $50 million funds 10 different programs, three of them are the governor's pets, well, just raise the taxes on the liquor and make it private. Consumers lose. So it's, it's, a, it's a much more complicated issue than just privatization, quote unquote. Yeah, I, 
you know, I think these are great comments. Just, uh, just to, to state WSWA's position, the Wine Spirit Wholesalers of America, um, you know, we really believe it's a state decision. You know, that's really how this system is set up for the local decision makers to make a decision on how they want to regulate their alcohol. We feel very strongly about states' rights. And, uh, you, know, if a, you know, so bottom line is we're neutral you know, if a state, uh, in these state debates or these state discussions. But I think Kelly you know, really mentioned the poster child of, of what could go wrong, and that's Washington. And I think it's a result of um, the process they went through, uh, going through a ballot initiative. Ballot initiatives in general um, are very, um, very limited in terms of scope, in terms of the amount of language that's in the law in terms of the amount of uh, different parties that can uh, vet it out uh, as opposed to a legislature environment where they can really um, have the discussions like they've had in Pennsylvania and they can really discuss it and really discuss it and really discuss it because this is an important um, product that really needs to be managed correctly at the state level. So um, yeah, I think the challenge ahead will be uh, if, if any other states do it through the ballot process, whether or not the, the correct uh, uh, structure is in place to allow for transparency or really tax collection, um, enough selection for the consumer, um, uh, understanding that, that where, the, where the product is landed, primary source, uh, and those things that we take for granted, whether we're in a control state or a state that has um, you know, independent distributors. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's our opinion that you know, we really got to make sure that these ballot initiatives are, are watched closely and um, you know, allow these states to make the decisions, hopefully, in their legislatures. Cool. All right, one final question before we get to the audience's questions. This is kind of the final wrap-up question here. So we are now 82-plus years into the three-tier system. How is it working out so far? What challenges do you see? Um, if you could reform the system at all, what would you do to the system? So let's start here with Kelly and then go down through the tiers. Well, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be exposed to a lot of different systems. Um, are there flaws in the system? There's flaws in every system. This system is the best run system in the entire world. Uh, when you look at some of the comments Brian made before, doing business in markets, progressive markets like Ireland and Great Britain, um, you look at, um, you know, bogus vodka, you know, uh, 50, hundreds of people getting sick because uh, they're drinking turpentine. You know, the government, this three-tier system has done a fantastic job of um, showing clear sight from supplier to consumer. Um, you know, we, we mentioned how could it be better? You know, the one thing that I think probably we all need to get better at is, is clarity in terms of things like DUI laws. Um, you know, what happens to if you go to another state and you, you, you deal with a radically different law? You know, do we deal with, you know, downward pressure on blood alcohol contents um, when they only really affect law-abiding citizens that go out and say, shit, should I have a second glass of wine or stick with one? The guy that's blowing, blowing 0.20 into a breathalyzer doesn't care about 0.02 and 0.04. And I think a lot of times it's a cop-out by state legislators by not dealing with the real problem, which is, you know, graduated stiff penalties for abusers of alcohol. Uh, you can look at somebody blowing through a, a school speed zone at 85 miles an hour, they're treated a hell of a lot differently than someone driving through at 30 miles an hour. I think the easy way out for a lot of legislators is to say, we've gone from 0.10 to 0.08 to 0.06 to 0.04 to 0.02, but we've done nothing with dealing with the real problems in society, which is a very small percentage of people, uh, but it's something I think that the three tiers and the government need to work together to do better. Cool. Brian. It's, it's, you know, it's a really interesting question. You know, uh, boy, we're in the greatest system in the world. Most selection, most dollars generated, uh, the greatest safeguards, most early market. You know, Kelly, I mean, mentioned, uh, you know, some of the problems over in the rest of the world. I, you know, you think Poland. You think Poland, you know, civilized society, right? Part of, um, you know, part of Europe. You know, they have problems. Uh, all the Eastern Euro European bloc countries have problems with uh, counterfeit or black market alcohol. The United Kingdom is having major problems. They're having major problems with overconsumption with their youth. Uh, they're having major problems with lack of selection and a high concentration with just a couple of customers. Uh, so, I mean, th those are real problems that other countries are facing. Now, I think our challenge in America is the fact that we take for granted um, the sensitivity of our product. 
And, and what I mean by that is um, I see a lot of you know, state regulators here tonight, and they're underfunded. They're not getting enough funding to, uh, to enforce the laws, to do what they need to do to get the job done. You look at the federal level with the TTB, and there's always talk about folding the TTB in or, uh, or just disbanding the TTB, which is the, uh, the governing body for our industry. And I think, you know, I think our, the biggest risk to our industry is for us to take for granted that we have a good system and not put enough investment into the regulatory end of things to make sure that the system works. You know, if you, if you don't have a TTB doing the things like checking labels and, and making sure that uh, the right product quality is in the bottles, that starts getting lax, then, you know, we could start looking like a European country. Gotcha. Uh, TTB, by the way, for those who don't know, that's alcohol... Uh, Alcohol Tax and, and Trade Bureau in, under the Treasury Department. And they collect the excise taxes and, and regulate the labels and that kind of stuff. So, Cool. Jim. Yeah, I think that uh, <coughs> Brian hit on a couple of really good points. And uh, we, we call it alcohol abuse apathy. We've been so successful with our uh, three-tier system and our regulation that we are beginning to forget some of the problems that this uh, product can cause. And so we need to be careful about that. And secondarily is the lack of enforcement funding. A lot of it was cut um, even before the Great Recession, but even more was cut. Uh, and I think that that's um, too bad because uh, we mentioned here that some of the folks are bypassing the laws. You mentioned the direct shipping, and we've got to have stronger enforcement. But what we haven't talked about is research. As we begin to embark on the possibility of national uh, legalization of recreational marijuana, there's not enough research to convince voters or legislators that maybe this isn't a good idea. And I think that research, we've always relied on, on research uh, from uh, organizations that are very well trusted in the government, whether it's NIAAA or the CDC. We need to make sure that when we make changes, there's studies or research that would indicate that this is a good choice, a good selection, and that there won't be any un unintended consequences. And we're finding out very early in the game with marijuana that now some studies are coming out and this is not as harmless as we've been led to believe. Um, so I would say that uh, to echo Brian's comments with uh, let's not uh, rest on our oils and be successful and forget the harm this product can cause and let's provide more enforcement, but let's also be mindful of the research. I think that um, uh, these products can cause harm to society and communities, and we need to know which policies work best. Following up on that, I think it's, we look at it as a, uh, the primary issue is what is good public policy? Uh, our, our industry, the retail industry, on and off premise, uh, we know that everybody doesn't do a perfect job, but we like to think for the most part, we take what we do very seriously. And, and in that I mean, you know, alcohol should, should not be sold to kids. Uh, we believe alcohol should be uh, sold by people who are licensed and trained to sell a product, a product that is dangerous, that if, if it is abused, uh, it is a good product if it is not abused and enjoyed by many, but uh, it, 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 needs a, it needs to be controlled. Uh, so just blatantly letting it go wherever anybody thinks, you know, uh, thinks it could be sold by anybody at any time, uh, we don't think is good public policy. And I want to commend the other tiers in the system for for what I would call, you know, good public safety. In the last year, we have had two different products. I'm not going to mention names, uh, but two products that had a had a recall, and I don't know that it even got to where the TTB or any other agency had to get involved. Uh, it wasn't a serious thing, and I don't even know if it was hardly even proven, but it, it was rumored that there was a problem with the product. The beer wholesalers and the liquor wholesalers that we, de that we de deal with daily literally swooped in, grabbed up anything that even had a hint of there potentially being something wrong with it, 
and like I say, it was never even proven that it was, but just because it was mentioned, uh, those two tiers came in and did the job that I think they should do. Uh, and we were glad that it was taken off our shelves uh, because it was the right public policy, it was the right thing to do to protect the citizens from even the slightest hint of an issue. You wouldn't find that in many of the countries that we've been discussing here. Uh, so I think that is the primary things that I see uh, the, the health, the safety, and good public policy that the three-tier system that we have by all the groups uh, represented here uh, is the biggest positive thing that we can say. I'd like to think of something better to say about your group. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good. Well, we get to, the, to everyone's favorite part of the evening, which is a chance to hear back from you, the audience. And uh, what we've done, we have microphones at both ends here of the auditorium. So if you'd like to, to ask a question, please get up and go to one of those two, and we'll be glad to entertain your question. <coughs> we've got about, about half hour for questions here. Uh, so, Garrett, I want to thank you and the panelists. Uh, this is fascinating. Certainly the best defense of the three-tier system I've ever come across. Uh, and we talked about sort of the 50 models, 50 states. Uh, but of course, as you well know, we're, despite the lack of congressional representation, there is a different model here in Washington, D.C., uh, where any retailer, I think it applies to retailers and uh, in-house license places where they can get an import permit. Seems like a pretty good model. Uh, and DC has one of the best selections, and the numbers show that we consume per capita, sort of certainly in the top ranks of any place in the country. So I'd love to hear the, the panel talk about this as a potential model, uh, or maybe critique it and say, what's wrong with it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that um, DC's uh, model, again, has suffered a bit from lack of funding. And I think that um, they, in our relationship with them, they would say that there are some outlets that uh, shouldn't be in business. As a matter of fact, um, there was a special on uh, CBS News not too long ago about a retailer who continued to sell to underage um, kids coming from um, a neighboring county that was a control county. And what prompted this story was a uh, fatal accident um, by um, one of the teenagers who uh, was supplied alcohol from this, from this retailer. So while the DC market um, has uh, 600,000 people, they have 300, over 300 liquor stores. And in Montgomery County, there is a million people, and they have close to 30 liquor stores. So the concern that um, public health advocates would have is the excessive, what they would consider to be excessive access in Washington, D.C., and um, I think the prices aren't very high, which also increases that access. So. While the selection is good, uh, I think that what the DC um, stores are able to do is do some loss leader uh, sales and um, get folks in the store. But if you tend to check uh, price by pro price by brand uh, down the line, that many of the control models aren't, aren't so far um, above that. Virginia's prices tend to be higher because their tax is higher uh, in Virginia. Uh, and that tax is set by the legislature, not by the Virginia ABC. And um, so while it may appear to be good, you have a great deal of uh, customer convenience and access, but there are some bad players um, that have caused concern uh, and grief with some of the other local um, governmental systems. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, cool. that's our take on it. Anyone else on the panel want to? I'm not really very familiar with uh, laws out here. Uh, I know many states, such as ours, and I'm sure not familiar with an import uh, permit. 
but uh, I think a lot of states, including ours, have a, a wide range, seems like a never-ending range of products all under the realm of one uh, permit. Uh, we can seem to get anything from about anywhere we, we want to. Uh, when you talk about permits and what you can sell and can't, uh, you may find it interesting, although I can sell beer, liquor, wine, cold or warm, I can't sell a cold bottle of water. I can sell a hot bottle of water. <laughs> That's a big market, hot water. <laughs> uh, especially in the summertime. Uh, so it kind of just goes back to the, what I said earlier. Every state has uh, its own set of quirky laws for some reason. I, I think, you know, I, I don't understand the nuances of, uh, of the district's laws, but I would say that um, I do understand um, tied house rules, and I understand what's going on in the UK. And basically, you have three retailers that control the, the marketplace, and they, um, they promote their products over other people's. They uh, over-promote their products at loss leaders. Uh, and then if they don't make enough money, they go back to the <coughs> other major producers and ask for um, uh, rebates from them. So it's really a difficult market for uh, major producers to work in under. And I think, um, I think that's the risk of a tight house environment, is that undue influence. Um, and, and I think you know, what we talked about with the three-tier system is it started as um, to have that middle tier be a buffer for the producer and have kind of that ability for the local um, um, and you know, local citizens to be able to create their own systems. And I think now one could argue it's also a buffer from the retail tier when you get these major conglomerates that are worldwide and um, aren't, might not have as many um, local ties, not, definitely not like Warren's business where he's local. And so I think that's, uh, I think that's the concern when you think about when you start talking about a tight house environment like that. I guess to add on to this here, I did some observations I've seen. I live in Virginia, and, uh, which is a hybrid state. I can go to the supermarket and buy beer and wine, but I have to go to a state store to buy liquor. And uh, then in the meantime, you've got DC right in the middle, which is a very, very open jurisdiction, and also Montgomery County right over the other side. So we've got two controlled jurisdictions bordering right on DC. So I think these, the DC liquor stores probably do very well from suburbanites who, who come in. Uh, and people are fairly sensitive about price. They, people do shop around, and I think they, they know how much either price or, ta or taxes can change the price of a single, of this exact same bottle. Um, I was chatting with one of the people who is running the event here tonight about a big trip that she does every year up to Maine, or every other year, and comes back uh, through New Hampshire. And have you all driven on 95 through New Hampshire? <laughs> the, the state stores, there's two of them, both sides of 95. And New Hampshire is a control state, but they have very, very low taxes. And so people, predominantly from Massachusetts, go across the border, buy, and bring it back. You know. And that happens here in DC. I'm sure it happens in many other places, especially where we have small states. But you also see it in big states where we have dry counties and people drive over the border. So this is just something that's gone on since 1933, 1934, I think. You know? well, I, I also think, too, that, that the spirit of that import license, because DC is not the only place that has this. You can get it in, in Massachusetts as well. Um, and we've used it once or twice for a retailer looking for a very, very unique product very, very high priced um, that for whatever reason our wholesalers have decided they want no part of. Um, and rather than give up the sale, we ship in two bottles or a bottle that, you know, um, but it's generally to two of the three of the very high end shops that already have consumers identified. Um, and it's kind of a way to service that consumer. But, um, you know, we have a, a full service wholesaler in the district. Um, We've, we've had uh, great service from them, but I think the spirit of the import license would be more to find that rare Bordeaux or that uh, rare one bottle of 38-year-old scotch that somebody has somewhere um, and to go to try to match that and service his customer base better. Um, I, th I think certainly when you start to get into a free-for-all with importers, uh, with retailers directi uh, directly importing product, um, that's already available for sale through a licensed U.S. importer, you open up a uh, Pandora's box that never gets closed and uh, creates a, you know, a, per a quick example for us is um, doing business in Ireland, we have a brand Clontarf Irish Whiskey. 
It's a fine brand. It's produced by uh, the Middleton Distillery, which produces Jameson. Um, we couldn't get arrested in Ireland because we had no way to ship our product direct. We had to go through a, a typical wholesale system, which added tremendous markup onto it. So we're not a producer. We lose producer's profit. We are a brand owner. We have to go through a wholesale that's adding on 25%, and our competitors have none of those margins. Um, Jim Beam decided a few years ago to stop making uh, house whiskey. We became the house whiskey at Aldi and went from zero to 10,000 cases overnight. You know, it's a hit or miss, and you're controlled by one or two customers, um, but the, certainly the, 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 the um, opportunities that exist out there are few and far between once you start to deviate away from the three-tier system. And, you know, the importer's license in, in, in D.C., it seems like something that's a negligible issue, but if taken to the wrong extent or abused, it, it can become quite a problem, which would result in a, you know, a law change, I think, you know, so. But I think that was the original intent of it, was to find something rare and unique that the second tier didn't want to deal with. Cool. Next question. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Warren, as an Indiana University student right now, if you ever want to take up the flag for the Sunday repeal again, you've got your first intern. Um, <laughs> well, as a Purdue grad, I'll get right on it. <laughs> <laughs> Killing me. Anyway, I have two questions. What do you guys think might be any, some lessons from the three-tiered system that legalize, like medical, not just medical marijuana legalization, but marijuana legalization it seems to be going towards uh, Canada just elected a prime minister who favors the legalization of marijuana. So I want to know what lessons you guys can draw from your experience on this new commodity. Also, I want to know if there's any international recognition that the U.S. is really making some good beers right now. And I wonder if we're kind of following getting out, you know, from the rock of Budweiser and Bud Light. So. <laughs> I don't know how to tell you to, uh, on the craft beers, I mean, it's tough enough getting into the market here. I don't know how to tell you to go to Europe and do that. You're kind of on, on your own now. On the marijuana thing, I mean, you know, the, there's a discussion is starting as to, as other states look at that. Uh, I sure know all the states are sure interested in the revenue stream that can come from that. I think, you know, we have a couple of models. One. Colorado, which was, well, I guess the first one really into it in a big way, uh, I think their model is a little shaky. Uh, it may be a good model as to, you know, what, what some things were done right and maybe a whole lot of things done wrong. I think some of the other states coming on now are learning from that as well. And I think that's really the kind of the way the, the states are going to evolve into it, I, I believe. Uh, a slow, steady process is much better uh, to avoid making long-term mistakes than just jumping in and hoping everything works. Uh, there's definitely some states, such as mine, that is a lot more conservative. Probably won't be one of the next few that get into it. Uh, but hopefully when we do, and I believe they will, because I just don't think they can turn down the potential revenue. I think it's just too big. I remember when they started in the lottery business, uh, which has now evolved to river boats and all kinds of things. All they wanted was a scratch-off ticket. That's all we'll ever want. <laughs> well, now it's <laughs> scratch-off tickets and online and you know dealers in casinos and on the water and off the water and and they're doing so well. The state now is kicking in money to help support them uh, because there's too many of them. So, you know, I don't know if that answers your question, but, uh, but I do know, you know, the, uh, there is conversations about, you know, how should the alcohol industry and the marijuana industry be involved together? And I don't know the, I don't know what the answer will be to that, but I can tell you that discussion is already starting uh, and will evolve as the states determine what their role is going to be. You know, I, I think yeah, you bring up a great question because it's happening, right, around the country. These discussions are happening with uh, marijuana. Some states are legal. There's 23, I think, that have medical marijuana. So we'll probably have more go um, uh, open, if you will, um, in the next year or two. 
Um, yeah, I think from our position, uh, from WSWA or Wine Spirits Wholesalers America, is you know um, we're neutral when it comes to whether these states open up or not. Uh, but we strongly believe that we uh, we can provide a good example of how a regulatory framework should be set up. Uh, uh, and I think that's I think that's uh, you know I think the lessons to be learned is the system that we have set up in place: a clear line in sight, checks and balances, an opportunity for control. Uh, ability to have an early market, ability to have tax collection, um, and ultimately have the states have their have their own um, decision in terms of what what uh, they want their marketplace to look like. Um, so I think um, I think the challenges are going to be um, the challenges we faced, and I think from a federal level we got to really look at uh, investing in resources to study some of these things. That uh, it's someone I think Jim mentioned science earlier. Um, drug driving is really uh, the, the challenge, right? Um, there's not a really good test for it. There's not um, solid science yet. There's some science, but it's not, hasn't been fully validated. Um, standards, yeah, I think the federal government can have some oversight on toxicity, uh, standards for drug driving, um, age, age of purchase standards. And so I think those are the type of things that um, um, at least that this, this industry that looks like it's um, going to keep growing and, and open up more states, that's the type of things they can look at from the alcohol beverage system. From a craft beer standpoint, I'll say that I'm from West Michigan, and it is like ground zero when it comes to craft beer. Uh, honest to God, I walked to the bus stop a, a couple months ago, and my neighbor said, guess what, I'm opening a craft brewery. So <laughs> it, it's, uh, there are, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is about a one million person population, I think we have like 40 breweries now. So it's just, Michigan's a great story to tell, and I think the story to tell from that is, uh, no, the rest of the world is not um, uh, keeping pace with the United States in terms of the, the number of craft breweries and all the innovation. And that innovation, experimentation, <coughs> Uh, doesn't happen uh, without this three-tier environment where they can uh, get access to the marketplace with an independent distribution model. I'd be remiss if I did not mention that the best tasting beer in the world was just voted, and it's from a Vermont control state craft brewery. <laughs> right? Eddie Topper. So I think with marijuana, while there needs to be a regulatory structure and these states that have legalized it are working on that, there also needs to be some uh, federal involvement to get standards of manufacture. I mean, to be a bourbon, to be called a bourbon, you have to follow certain rules and guidelines. But for marijuana, there are no guidelines. There is no federal uh, involvement. And that's because it's still a Schedule One felony. And so that problem <laughs> is going to have to be resolved. And I suspect uh, it won't be resolved until the next uh, a president's in office, and it may not get resolved there. But I, I think that's a problem with uh, marijuana. I mean, you don't know how much THC you're getting, you're ingesting, when you have a brownie or a cookie or whatever. And when you have a drink of uh, bourbon, you tend to know how much ethanol you're getting. And so I think that's a problem in the marijuana industry. I'll just say one final thing about the beers. Um, you know, we mentioned before about Ireland and England being very controlled in terms of the amount of outlets, and you know, three in one country and a four in the other. There's a lot of uh, craft beer only retail shops opening up, and they're dominated by American beers. So you see, you know, I've been going there for 15 years, and starting about oh, four or five years ago, you'd see one here or one there. Now there's two dominant wholesalers in Ireland who do nothing but import American craft beer. So there is an export market for it. It is considered high quality product, and it is you know, gaining traction out there. Cool. Uh, we have time for one final question, and that honor goes to Bruce, Bruce Guthrie. Um, thank you. This is a question out of total ignorance, so I'm sure it's going to be good. Um, <laughs> one of the complaints that you usually hear about free trade agreements is that they, uh, people say they undermine local controls of things that they want. How have free trade agreements, do you guys have any idea how free trade agreements have treated alcohol? Is it simply exempted from consideration? Or have laws changed as we've entered into free trade agreements? OK. Um, let me say that, uh, let me bring up an, a European Union example. Um, Sweden, as I mentioned, Sweden, Norway, and Finland are all control models. 
And in order to join the European Union, uh, they had to fight to maintain and retain their control model. They did have to give up their production, believe it or not. Absolute was um, produced by the state, by, by Sweden. And uh, when they became members of the EU, uh, EU had some issues with that uh, and, and made them get out of the production. But uh, because of public health reasons, the Nordic countries were able to maintain their model. So there's, there's an economic uh, impact, but you can also have public health. Now, as far as the United States, uh, we do watch the, uh, the World Trade uh, Organization to uh, make sure that um, they don't uh, in influence the regulatory structure for alcohol uh, today. I, I think every tier is mindful that it's possible that because Europe has such free access for some of their products and coming into the states, it's a little more stilted that they have complained and made some complaints. But as, as so far, our trade ambassador has been able to uh, push back. And uh, it's oftentimes for, for public health reasons. It's, um, it's not um, it, it, that seems to be inviolate, if you will, for those kinds of issues. I think um, at least it's not to say that the folks in Belgium aren't interested in breaking down some of these three-tiered barriers that they, that they see, but so far the, uh, we've been able to hold off uh, major changes from free trade agreements. And there certainly has been a few times you've seen like brands come up. That's, that's, that can be an issue. Certainly Budweiser, there's a, there is the original Budweiser beer in the Czech Republic. Uh, they can't call that a Bud, you know, Budweiser in, here in the United States. It goes by the name Czech Var because Anheuser-Busch has the trademark here. And they have it in a number of other European countries as well. Um, we had an agreement, I think like 10 years ago or so, with, with France. We have a couple lower end uh, sparking winemakers who call themselves Champagne. And at the end of World War I, part of the Treaty of Versailles put in there, that the, the French put this in there, that you could only call Champagne that actually comes from the Champagne region of France. And uh, so we still have a few that were grandfathered in, and they tend to be lower end stuff. But those are the, the few that I know about. Yeah, um, I, I think, yeah. Um, you know, I think we're starting to get into some international conversation, but I think the challenge is, um, um, maintain a conversation with the World Trade Organization so those type of examples as they permeate up can get handled because I think there's recent um, examples of where certain members of uh, either the European Union or whatnot want to have proprietary rights to certain terms. Mm -hmm. And that exists for sherry, for port, for tequila. Everybody's trying to maintain that, even Parma ham. The Parma ham comes from Parma, Italy. I I've never been there, but <laughs> uh, they don't want other ham producers to you use. Got a lot of pigs there. Yeah. So at any rate, that, that exists uh, as free trade agreements. I think some countries are trying to carve out those, uh, those uh, classifications. Well, very good. We want to thank everyone so much for coming here tonight and learning about how we, how we regulate alcohol in the United States since the end of Prohibition in 1933. I especially want to thank our panelists here, Kelly Spillane, Brian Fox, Jim Squeal, and Warren Scheid for their time. They, they flew in from around the country to be here as part of this panel. So if you would, please give them a nice round of applause. Thank you all so much for coming tonight, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.